Consider this. Two journalists get together for an on-air chat. One of them has been away from the media for more than 15 years. The other has been a constant source of America's political information for almost 40 years. What will they talk about? Certainly not traditional politics. I'm Yvonne Greer, journalist number one. Journalist number two is award-winning PBS co-host and managing editor Judy Woodruff. Next on Consider This. Finding a profession you could enjoy for decades is certainly a gift to be treasured. And our guest, Judy Woodruff, has done just that with America's political climate. Welcome, welcome to Consider This. Yvonne, it's <laughs> great to be here, and it's great to be back in Peoria. <laughs> Thank you so much. So take me back, if you would please, to your childhood, because I know when I would watch the news as a kid, it sounded like the teacher in Charlie Brown, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> Was it always something you were interested in? No, it wasn't. And I, you may not want me to go back this far. <laughs> How much time do we have? <laughs> but I, I grew up as an Army brat, born in Tulsa, Oklahoma, moved to Germany as a little girl, and then came back to the U.S., lived all around the U.S. at different Army bases, then to Taiwan, back to the U.S. again. Eventually, my father was based at Fort Gordon, Georgia, near Augusta. So that's where I ended up going to school and graduating from high school. When I graduated from high school, this was back in the 60s, mm -hmm. there really weren't very many women role models. My mother had never even finished high school, much less gone on to college. But she had constantly said to me, you're going to get a college education. You're going to college. <laughs> But when it came to thinking about what do I want to do, I wasn't sure. And so I headed off to school, decided to major in math because I actually liked math. Mm -hmm. uh, but somewhere along the lay way, changed course, uh, fell in love with political science. And that's how it all kind of got started. Was there a defining moment for you in one of those poli-sci courses? Well, it really was, it really had to do, and this is a tribute to the profession of teaching, it had to do with a professor I had in my freshman year at Meredith College in Raleigh, North Carolina. I ended up transferring later to Duke, but I happened to be taking a course in calculus at the time. <laughs> and the, the instructor, who was a grad student from another school, he thought women really shouldn't be taking advanced math. So I was getting mixed signals. I was getting the signal that I shouldn't really be studying math. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I was having, I was loving learning about politics and political science from this woman professor at the same school. And that, that really was what turned the light on for me. I ended up uh, switching majors, um, uh, went on to transfer to Duke, mm -hmm. where I graduated, and was going to work in Washington. I had fallen in love with the idea of you know, remember what John Kennedy said, ask not what your yes. country can do for you, what can you do for your country? That really grabbed me at mm -hmm. some point along the way when I was finishing school. And so I, I went to Washington, worked as an intern, thought I would go back to Washington and work in one of the agencies, work on Capitol Hill. But the second summer I worked there as an intern while I was still in college, the women I met on the Hill who were assistants and deputies and assistants and clerks and the mm -hmm. rest of it, all of whom had finished college, had graduate degrees. They all said, don't come to Washington because mm. you won't be taken seriously and you won't get a decent job and a fair shake. So just try something else, do, you know, figure out what you're going to do, but don't come to Washington. I went back to Duke my senior year, told a professor about this. I was really dispirited. And he said, you know, did you ever think about covering politics? Ah. That was, so there were two light bulbs. One was that, that professor I had in college, and the other, frankly, was another professor who said, um, you know, think about journalism. And here I was about to graduate from college, but, but it, it seemed to me like the smart thing to do. So I tried it. I got a job as a secretary, mm -hmm. <laughs> working for one of the three um, network affiliates in Atlanta, the, the ABC, then ABC affiliate and went to work as a secretary. I was cleaning the film, answering the phone, um, typing letters for the news director, and that's how it all started. And what made you make the jump from secretary to actual journalist? Well, I told the news director constantly that I wanted to go out with the camera crews and I wanted to learn. I wanted to just soak up anything that I could because I was interested in being a reporter. And his constant refrain to me was, 
why do you want to be a reporter? We already have a woman reporter. Oh. <laughs> so in other words, I was hearing in journalism the same thing I was hearing on Capitol Hill. But the course, box had been checked. <laughs> it had been checked. And you have, to, you have to remember that this was the decade, by then it was the late 60s. The women's movement was in full flower in this country. Women were marching. But it, it's just, it was taking a long time. And these were, these were very male-run mm -hmm. institutions, whether it was politics, uh, Capitol Hill, or whether it was journalism. It was mostly men. Women were still tokens. Uh, fortunately, after a year and a half at that station, uh, another one of the news directors in town, I had been lobbying anybody I could find, <laughs> calling, writing letters, writing radio stations, any, anything I could do to get a job. He called me one day and he said, we're going to lose our reporter covering the state legislature and I'd like you to come over for, a, you know, an interview. And, and that's what happened, long story short. He hired me to cover the Georgia state legislature. I was a year and a half out of college, didn't know anything about reporting. So I had to learn from the ground up and it was baptism by fire. And how did you do? Well, in the beginning, it was kind of ugly. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know, I didn't, first of all, I didn't know who... I, I majored in political science, so you would say, well, you knew something about it. But the fact is, studying political science, and frankly, a lot of it was international politics relations, and covering a southern state legislature with 205 members of the House of Representatives, mm -hmm. 56 members of the state Senate, there was a lot of getting to know yes. that had to happen. I had to know who people were, had to understand the issues. Of course, I was reading up. But you, you just, you know, you're not, you're not handed a, a, a silver platter and, and people say, here, here's how you do it. You're thrown in and they wait and see whether you drown or not. But you are obviously a woman who loved the homework. I love the homework. I love getting to know people. I just felt like I was in my element. I was, I was working long days. I was working weekends whenever I could. And, and that's how I learned. I spent five years covering the state legislature. When they weren't in session, they were only in session excuse me, for part of the year. I covered City Hall in Atlanta. I sometimes covered the county commission in Atlanta. I covered uh, local crime a little bit. I mean, I tried to sort of get my mm -hmm. feet wet in a number of different areas. But along the way, I just fell in love with journalism and reporting. And that's how it all happened. And now you've worked for most of the major networks, CNN, NBC, PBS. When did right. you get your first network break? Well, what happened was I had been covering the uh, Georgia politics for five years, and I was watching my colleagues go off and apply for jobs in bigger cities. Mm -hmm. Atlanta's a big city, of course, but they were, apply they were getting hired in Washington or New York or L.A. Mm -hmm. to be reporters and anchors. And I thought, life is passing me by. I'm all of 28 years old. <laughs> I need to go do this. You're about one. to be washed up. <laughs> so I just took it upon myself to, without any real introduction other than a, a letter from the news director to the guy, people at CBS, I went up and knocked on the doors of all three networks in New York and did cold interviews. I'm, I mean, without, you know, any real background and said, I, I'm, I'd love to come to work for you as a, as a beginning reporter. And they were very polite, but they didn't have any... <laughs> anything and I think they looked at me like are you crazy but that act in and of itself takes a lot of chutzpah where it, does that come from in in retrospect it takes because I'm not naturally if you meet me and you didn't know what I did you would probably think I was a fairly soft-spoken a uh, little bit of a southern accent from all those years we lived in the south uh, uh, you know not laid back so much but not a pushy broad mm -hmm. if you will but I had to have a lot of confidence to do that as I think back <laughs> on it. And one of the vice president, one of the NBC vice presidents said, look, go take some voice lessons, uh, work on your Southern accent, because by then I had developed mm -hmm. a little bit of a Southern accent. And he said, call us in another year. So I went back to Atlanta and I was completely defeated. I thought, a year, mm -hmm. you, know, it, it, you know, you're 28 years old. I was anxious to move ahead. I saw my life passing by. <laughs> And two weeks later, I, I went through the Yellow Pages, found a voice coach, called her up, made an appointment, had not even had my first appointment with her when uh, he called me back, this vice president of NBC News, and he said, we've just fired our reporter in our Southeastern Bureau, which was located in Atlanta. And he said, can you just quickly send me another audition tape? Long story short, within two days, they had hired me. Uh, to be their reporter. So That's almost are, miraculous. It's kind of miraculous. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 as I think back on it, the timing 
was pretty extraordinary. And I went to work for NBC. At that point, I thought I knew a lot about reporting, but again, it was a huge learning curve because the networks have their own way of doing things, their own way of writing stories, of putting a story together, of developing a story, and you've got to run all your scripts by an editor and you don't mm -hmm. see in New York, you're on the road. I mean, I lived out of a suitcase for two straight years. I was called in the middle of the night to go cover a hurricane or once a hanging in the Bahamas. I was responsible with one other correspondent for the entire 10 states of the Southeast plus uh, the wow. Caribbean. <laughs> and I went to cover a hanging in the, an American uh, young man was, had been convicted of a crime. It was, so I went sent down there to, mm -hmm. I never got into the prison, but I was standing outside talking about this execution and thinking, you know, who knew the, starting out covering politics, I was going to be doing something like this. Mm -hmm. But it was, you know, all in all, it added up to experience. I was covering murder trials. I covered, uh, I, for a while I called myself the, the wildlife reporter because I was covering uh, uh, fire ant plagues in South <laughs> Georgia, alligator farms in Louisiana, blackbird kills in Kentucky. <laughs> they would just send me around to cover whatever was general news. But along the way, what happened was the fellow I had covered as governor of Georgia, Jimmy Carter, uh. also was running for president, the peanut farmer who nobody took seriously. And I kept saying to NBC, you better pay attention to this guy. He's really serious. <laughs> Lo and behold, he starts winning, and they let me cover him a little bit, but then as soon as he started really doing well, they pull me off the campaign mm -hmm. because I was so green. I was brand new at the network, but I hung in there. I mean, they let mm -hmm. me be kind of the third man uh, in the totem pole uh, for pretty much all of the 76th president, excuse me, presidential campaign. And that's how I learned, you know, covering presidential politics. 76, the Democratic Convention, in New York was the first uh, convention. I've covered everyone since then. Wow. Democrats and Republicans. Kudos to so. you. That is amazing. You get to see and hear so much more than the average public when you're covering these political campaigns. We see things like West Wing and scandal and wonder, mm -hmm. is it really that way? How close do those types of shows come to what's really happening in Washington behind the scenes? I love those shows too, but you know, they're only a flicker of an <laughs> echo of what's real. In real life, it's a whole lot. I wanna say it's not boring, but, but there's a, there are a long intervals of just work, 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 work and disappointment and then boom, it's exciting and something happens and you're in a fight with the media or if you're in the White House or if you're a candidate. Um, it's, but it is on balance. If you compare politics to so many other, that's the only, I mean, that's the one thing I've covered consistently mm -hmm. throughout my reporting career. It is a whole lot more interesting on any given day in, day out basis, week in, week out. There's something always going on in politics. So even if it's a time when, uh, you know, say the state legislature isn't in session or Congress isn't in session, People are always working on something. There's an issue that's risen to the fore mm -hmm. that people are lobbying for. Somebody's trying to get elected or somebody's trying to get reelected. And it's, it's, it's a great human drama. And that's, to me, that's what's so fascinating about it. It's both the study of policy, which I'm fascinated by. I love looking mm -hmm. at budgets and tax <laughs> bills and all that. I love looking at all those things. Then you I, are certainly in the right position. <laughs> <laughs> because the average American, I would guess, um, looks at politics in terms of when's the next election, right. who, which candidate am I going to vote for? Would you have any words of advice about the current political climate and, and what the average person who's really more concerned about, am I getting to work today? Right. Are my kids doing well in school? Am I paying the house note? That sort of thing. Exactly. It's difficult to pay attention to everything going on politically. How do people discern what's most important for them? It is. That's a very good question, Yvonne. And, and a lot of, I think, and a lot of the disillusionment today with politics has to do with the fact that if you turn on your television, you pick up the newspaper, you're reading about yet another fight that's going on or yet another squabble or another impasse, a, a gridlock, they can't mm -hmm. get anything done. That's a little bit of an exaggeration, but not much of one. Washington is definitely far more dysfunctional today than it's ever been in the 37, 38 years that I've been there. I've never seen it uh, at, a, you know, at a place where the two parties were as far apart and as polarized as they are and frankly now reflecting the American people. But what I would say to voters and to people who lead normal lives and who, as you say, have to go about their business every day, mm -hmm. worry about their job, worry about their family, about their children, um, 
is, is to think of it by and large as a much more honorable profession than I think is its reputation. Most of the people I know who go into politics go into it because they want to do something for the greater good mm -hmm. of whether it's the country, if they're serving in Washington, or if they're serving in Illinois, it's, it's because this is what they care about. And what happens is you get to, say you get to Washington, and if you're part of either the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, you, if you're elected to office, you often get caught up in these squabbles, these fights that represent what your political party wants. And it's hard to stick your head above you know, the, the crowd, if you will, and say, wait a minute, no, I don't necessarily agree with my party on that. I mm -hmm. think we ought to think about this middle road. That's kind of discouraged. I mean, today you are, especially you are rewarded or punished if you don't go along with your Hold party. the party line. And then, and what you have as a result is this kind of implacable separation and this fight that repeats itself and repeats itself. So I can see why people get discouraged. But I, I think we have to remember to hold, we have to ask our public servants to live up to what they, you know, to remember their why they took the and job. Remember why they went there in the first place. I know that you're in Peoria to interview our former 18th District Congressman and former Secretary of Transportation, right. Ray LaHood, who has written a book on bipartisanship and his efforts in that regard. Do you see that there are a lot of bipartisan efforts currently underway to help combat some of those things you were just talking about? There are efforts underway, Yvonne, but they're very much under the radar. There are smaller efforts. I mean, there are several nonprofit groups in Washington uh, that are working toward bipartisanship, even nonpartisanship. There's a group called No Labels that's trying to get the parties to work together. There are groups on Capitol Hill that are quietly trying to get the two sides to work together. But when it comes to the leadership, and especially as we head into a presidential and another congressional election year, there's so much at stake in all of these races that, that the leadership finds it very hard to put their, their opinions aside and their preferences aside and say, oh, no, let's just, let's try to find yeah. a way to work together. I mean, listen to the presidential candidates right now. I mean, they're, they're on a separate track. They're running for the White House. Mm -hmm. And the last thing you're seeing them do, for the most part, is say, you know, some of them will say this every once in a while, but generally they're trying to draw stark differences between themselves and the folks on the other side of the political aisle. Because they're right, who are they appealing to right now? They're appealing to partisans in their own party. Mm -hmm. They're heading into the primary season in early 2016. So Democrats are looking to appeal to Democratic voters. Republicans are looking to Republican voters. Once you get all that sorted out and you know who the nominees are for the two parties, you come together, they're each going to be looking for ways to appeal to the broader body, body politic, the broader electorate. But right now, it's a lot of yelling and ranting and <laughs> raving in many instances, appealing to uh, the voices in their own party. That's why it sounds like they're so far apart, even when in many cases they may not be. So if the scope of the political climate has changed so very much, let's talk now, if we could, about the scope of the journalism climate and the folks covering these events. Do you find that, that there is still that, in my heart, this is what I've done because I want to bring the information to the people? Because sometimes, again, as a layperson watching the news, it looks like, well, you're, you just seem to be kind of in this for you and the salaciousness of the argument and that sort of thing. Speak to me, if you would, about the changing face of journalism, the power of women now in journalism, because there are more of them, but still not many more in the controlling aspects of journalism. Well, the first thing I can tell you is from the standpoint of the PBS NewsHour, which I'll <laughs> give a plug for right now, that Absolutely. my co-anchor, Gwen Eiffel, and I feel very strongly that what we're in this to do is to inform people to shine a light on the most important stories of the day, every day that we do the program, and to invite people to make up their own minds. That we are not a program you come to for shouting and screaming and taunting and criticizing. Uh, yes, we want people to come on and be uh, candid and, and direct about mm -hmm. their views. We're not looking to suppress disagreement. But we are there to inform and to enlighten and to give people the whole story, and then they can, again, they can make up their own minds. But granted, we are one slice of the news media picture. There are a number of other outlets out there who like to do it in a different way. And to my knowledge, is there another media outlet that has two female anchors? We, we are celebrating the fact that we are it. <laughs> we are the first female co-anchor team to broadcast on national television. 
outstanding, pretty if exciting. I do say so myself. Pretty <laughs> exciting, pretty exciting. So, we, and we just celebrated our second anniversary of, of, of co-anchoring together. But to get to your question, Yvonne, about what's happened to the news media broadly, clearly there's much more opinion out there than there used to be. Clearly there's more rewarding of conflict than there used to be. There's so many more outlets, so many more shows. Some channels are just about conflict mm -hmm. and just about one side of the political spectrum or the other. You know, if that's what people want, they've got plenty of places to go, not to mention online, on the internet, social media. Um, but what we're trying to do with the news hour on, on public broadcasting and also online, I mean, we are very, very um, uh, dedicated to our online presence and to having an, a presence, a strong presence in social media, Facebook, Twitter, mm -hmm. and so forth, and trying to do a lot of, a, much more of the, the interactive uh, kind of journalism that, that the younger generation has come to expect. We think that's the future, and the future is now as far as we're <laughs> concerned, so we're doing a lot more of that, but we're committed to that. But you're absolutely right, journalism has changed, a lot of newspapers have closed down or downsized, and I think you know, journalism in general has taken a big hit in this country, and we're kind of in the middle of a transition figuring out where we go from here. But in you the meantime, we're, we're trying to stay true to what we believe. You spoke about your challenges as a woman trying to enter the news industry, yeah. and I know that you are making strides to help other women enter the news industry and do well as journalists. Tell me about your foundation. There's an organization called the International Women's Media Foundation that a, a group of women journalists in Washington and New York and I were involved in um, founding exactly 25 years ago. It was around 1990, and we had organized an international conference for women journalists. This came about at the time democracy was, I guess you could say, breaking out in different parts of the world. In the Philippines, they were coming out of the Marcos regime to a to a, a more democratic system. South Africa was changing from an apartheid system to uh, moving towards something uh, uh, more democratic, um, certainly in Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. the Soviet Union. We were right on, the, there was just change everywhere you looked. And we wanted to make sure that as that was happening, and we knew that when democracy comes along, there should be a free press that comes along. It turns out we've learned since then it's not always so straightforward. But when the free press comes along, we wanted to make sure that women knew that there was a place for them and that they were encouraged and celebrated and given a chance to have not only equal opportunity at jobs, but equal opportunity to advance. And so we reached out to women journalists around the world. We had one conference in 86 before we even created the foundation. We had another one in 1990. Uh, just as we were uh, 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 coming into existence. I was the founding co-chair of the I IWMF, mm -hmm. International Women's Media Foundation. And since then, we have grown and become the, really, the only organization uh, in the world that reaches out consistently to women in country after country after country and says to them, if you're looking for a place for support, for guidance, for, um, frankly, legal help, for training. We want to be here for you. We give out awards every year for women who've exhibited extraordinary courage in reporting, women who, in many cases, put their lives on the line to cover a story, whether it's been because they challenged a government who didn't want them there, mm -hmm. or private sector. I mean, there are just so many different circumstances. The, one, uh, the last thing I'll say quickly about this is that we don't appreciate enough in the United States what it means to have a free press. You know, we, the bad thing that happens to us in, in this country is you can't get somebody to return your phone call yeah. and you complain about that or you can't get access to all the documents right. and you're you want. not punished or oppressed you're not but you don't have people shutting you down you don't have the government coming after you as they do in Russia and shutting down newspapers or in South America or parts of Eastern Europe today in China and my husband and I were just there on a, a trip a few weeks ago um, the media is completely controlled by the government and when people have tried to be more vocal online or in social media uh, they are, there's a crackdown. So we have much to be thankful for in this country and having a free press is right at the top. It's, it's helped remind me 
uh, you know, just, you know, we cannot take it for granted. Well, as a viewer, I am thankful for you and Gwen Eiffel and all of the work that you do on the PBS NewsHour. We thank you for your efforts. I thank you here for your time on Consider This. Was an, what an amazing journey that you've had. And it almost feels like a full circle moment for me to have you start out as one who was not recognized because you were a woman and be able to give back to women all over the world. Amazing accomplishments. Judy Woodruff, thank, thank you for you. being with us. Thank you, Yvonne. It's been my pleasure. And thank you for being with us on Consider This. We're going to pause for a moment and take a look at our Feature Artist of the Week. I'm a fiber artist, and um, what I do and what I enjoy doing most of all is creating art from recycled materials. I use a lot of things from thrift stores, where I take the upcycled sweater coats, which take 15 to 25 sweaters that I cut apart and put back together again. I really love doing the big dresses, and a lot of these are, are created by using recycled materials or things that have been used in, in other projects. I like conceptual pieces the best. I've always loved art ever since I was a baby. I used to color my father's medical books. I've always had a love for art. I trained as a, as a registered dietitian, and it wasn't what I wanted to do. So I had an opportunity, I came back to Peoria, and um, I thought it's now or never. The reason I started doing fiber art is really multifaceted. I've always enjoyed working with my hands and using fiber. Fiber art is many things. It's not going to Walmart and picking out cheap yarn and knitting a baby blanket. Fiber art is anything using fibers. I remember when I lived in Europe seeing the magnificent tapestries hanging from castle walls. I mean, they were, I don't know, 40 feet by 20 feet. You think of the bio tapestry, you know, which takes up a whole room. There's just, there's just a lot. I have to create. I have to create or I would die. It's like breathing for me. And to do what I've done, I had to make some very, very difficult decisions, giving up a lucrative career, you know, totally changing. I've never had an art class in my life. So to do what I've done is, you have to be passionate. You have to be obsessive about it. I do this 18 hours a day, six days a week. It's all I do. Thanks to our featured artists and thanks to my guest, Judy Woodruff of the PBS NewsHour. And thank you for watching Consider This. We'll see you next time.